Audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. Most of us, or some of us, hate ourselves. I mean, we live with this constant dissatisfaction, this quiet desperation, this depression, because we've got this feeling that we just don't matter, that we're insignificant. Now, let me tell you something that life has taught me as well. When what Jesus says about you becomes more real to you than what other people say about you, you're going to have a self-esteem that's off the charts. You're going to enjoy your life again. Today. 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 Today with Jeff Fines. We are taking the gospel to the world. Pastor, apologist, and Bible teacher. One truth that will be delivered in love and compassion, connecting every one person to all that God has promised them. You make me Today. Today. Today with Jeff Vines. Hello, my name is Bill and welcome to Today with Jeff Vines. In today's episode, Pastor Jeff finishes a message from Genesis chapter 15. He's speaking about living every day in a way that celebrates God's covenant made with us. If you've missed any of this series, you can catch up wherever you listen to your podcasts. You just need to search for Today with Jeff Vines. Let's hear the rest of this message now. Here's Pastor Jeff. Now, for those of you Right now, you're saying this, Pastor Jeff, I don't know you very well, but are you telling these people that they can do whatever they want and still be blessed by God? My answer is, you're missing the point. The point is, when what Jesus did for you becomes real, really real, your trust level goes off the charts, and your pursuit of righteous living is unparalleled by any other pursuit in your life. When the cross becomes more real to you, then you will see the Father as the compassionate Father that He is. You will see how He's provided for you, how He doesn't even hold your offenses against you, how He separates your sins as far as the East is from the West because He's intent on blessing you. When you see the heart of the Father like that, two things are going to happen. Number one, you will see the disintegration that sin actually causes because the cross will become real to you. You'll have this vivid imagery of God becoming man and suffering for you. And you'll look at that and you'll say, in other words, the cross will become more real to you than the false promises that sin offers. And because it's so real to you, you'll reject it. You'll know that it destroys, that it's costly, that it disintegrates, and it caused disintegration. You'll realize the links at which God went for you to give you victory and power over the things that can destroy you. And when the cross becomes that real to you, Your passion will be to pursue righteousness, knowing what God the Father has done for you. You'll say to yourself, how could I not live in honor of the king who walks through the pieces? You know what else you'll do? When you come face to face with that kind of temptation, there'll be something in you that will not want to wound the heart of God. I had three brothers. Man, I don't know how my mom survived. We fought all the time, man. We put our fists through glass and through drywall. We threw things at each other. I mean, I remember slapping my brother with a ping pong paddle as hard as I could and then running. It was sandpaper, the kind they used to make, you know, just to do the, the most damage. I remember throwing a bicycle wheel at my younger brother. I mean, we, and I remember my mom grounding us all the time. I also remember that it didn't work. I mean, think about it. If you're fighting and then your mom grounds you and she puts you all in your room, then you're just in close proximity to one another. So the fighting continues. And now you're mad. I spent most of my young adult life indoors. (laughs) But then when I was 12, 13, maybe a little younger, probably it would have been more like 10 or 11, actually. My brothers and I, we were fighting again, doing our thing in the summer because school was out and we had to be home. Tension. And I remember my mom walking into the room and seeing us fight, yelling, screaming, and she just sat down and began to weep. 
That did something to us. I think maybe for the first time we realized we were wounding the heart of our mom, and that was a bit too much for us. When what Jesus did for you on the cross becomes more real to you than the enticement and shallow offerings of the world, you'll live a righteous life. You say, well, what happens? You know, there's so many what we call Christian atheists. A Christian atheist is someone who does actually mouth the right words. I believe Jesus is the cross, the son of the living God. Yeah, I believe the church is a good thing, but their everyday living is to live as though he doesn't exist. They're called Christian atheists. And the reason they are Christian atheists is because their anchor is the water, but it doesn't go down deep enough. They know Christ, but he's not become so real to them that their transformation starts to happen in their lives. Now stay with me, okay? When I lived in New Zealand, my friend Bill McCarthy, who produced our television program called Questions of Life, invited my father and me down to the Coromandel Peninsula, a beautiful place on the east coast of the North Island of New Zealand, and we were going to go fishing. And so we got in this small boat, very small boat, Bill, myself, my father, and we began to go out to sea. Now, Auckland, the Maori name for Auckland is Aotearoa. It means land of the long white cloud because in the evening, clouds just settled in. And we had been out for about an hour, and I noticed we were experiencing whiteout. Whiteout is when the clouds and the water are the same color, so you can't tell where one stops and the other begins. So I I knew we'd been in the water for quite a long time, and I was nervous that we were drifting a long way out. We didn't have life jackets or enough life jackets, two for three people. And I knew I could get one on before my dad because I was stronger, but still, I love my dad. You know, I want my dad to survive, so... And I knew my dad was weak, and I knew he'd never be able to swim. This was about two or three years before the end of his life. And finally, Bill McCarthy noticed that I was nervous, and he looked at me and said, Jeff, are you okay? I said, well, no, not really. We've been drifting a long time. We're a long way from the coast, and you know the weather's bad, and I can't see where we are. I'm, I'm just not confident. And he said, Jeff, we're about 30 yards off the, uh, off, off the beach. <laughs> he said, it, it's called an anchor. And I dropped it when we first got out here. I felt a lot better then because he had let the anchor go down deep into the rocks. And I thought we were drifting, but we weren't. We were just going around in circles. Now think about the anchor for a moment. What the anchor doesn't move around, does it? If you go down deep enough, then the vicissitudes of the water really don't matter. The ebb and flow don't matter. The anchor holds for many who are struggling to live this kind of life for many of us. We got the right anchor, but it doesn't go down deep. And because it doesn't go down deep, the cross has never become more real to us than any other thing we face in life. Can I give you a couple examples? And would you stay with me here? We hold grudges and refuse to forgive those who've offended us. Why do we do that? I mean, because it's a poison. For some, they never get over it and it ruins their entire lives. Why? They, they, they still may be saved, but they're not living the abundant life. And here's the reason why. Because what someone did to them is more real to them than what Christ did for them. When Christ, what Christ did for you becomes more real to you than what someone else did to you, you will forgive. It's a natural cause and effect. It's a sliding rule. The more you fall in love with Christ and his cross, the more you see what he really did on the cross for you, the more real the cross of Jesus Christ becomes to you, and the more, the more real it what Christ did for you becomes, then the less real what other people did to you becomes. The more, the more real the cross of Christ becomes, the less real that what people did to you. You start to realize, my goodness, God treats me as though I've had no offense against him. I've offended him and yet the promises are mine. And you start to think, if God can treat me like that, how can I treat my brother? Think about this. We're angry and bitter people. We're not happy because our life's not going the way we think we deserve. We don't have the house we want, the car we want. We don't have the stuff that we think we're rightfully entitled to. Or somebody's wounded us and we feel like God let them get away with it. Somebody's betrayed us. Somebody stepped over us to climb a corporate ladder and knocked us on the way down. Our boss is rude and ridicules us. Life is not the way we think it is. And we're angry and we're bitter about it because we don't really trust that God is just and his providence will win in the end. We ask God questions like, why did you allow that to happen? Why did that happen to my kid? Why did that happen to my family? Why did that happen to my marriage? Why did that happen to my finances? 
And the reason that we're so bitter and angry at those things is because the cross is not yet more real to us than the circumstances of our life. Because if it was, you would see your circumstances through the cross. What does that mean? It means that even when you are in your worst possible situation of your life, that God takes all that chaos and brings beauty and pattern and design to it. That even when Jesus was in the worst miserable place of his life, God was still doing immeasurably more than you and I could ever ask or imagine. He was providing salvation. The message of the cross, when it becomes real to you, it's amazing what happens to you. Suddenly what Jesus did for you becomes more real than what the world tries to do to you. And you interpret it and translate it all in the context that God is able to work everything out. All the chaos in your life, no matter how chaotic it is, he can bring beauty, pattern, and design into your life because he's promised to prosper you. And you start living below those circumstances and with anxiety and depression when the things that have happened to you become more real to you than what Christ has done for you. When what Jesus did for you becomes more real to you than what other people might do to you, think about how free you're going to be to truly live. You're going to be courageous, man. Did you hear that? You're not going to be afraid of anything. When what Jesus did for you becomes more real to you than what people might do to you, man, you live with a sense of bonus and courage and you get it done. I met a pastor in Darjeeling, India by the name of Silas. Incredible story. He works as a civil engineer. The first half of his life he spent killing Christians. Okay, He loved to find Christian pastors with beards, sneak up behind them, and set their beards on fire. That's enough reason right there to shave, guys. Nah, beards are fine. We had lunch together and he told me that his whole mission in life, in the early part of his life, the first half of his life is to kill the Christians. And here's why. Because in Hinduism, they worship 335 million gods. And so if you're monotheistic, if you worship one God, as the Christians do, then their concern is that you won't be worshiping the other millions of gods. And because you're not doing that, that the gods then will bring curse upon the people in the land. So the only way to protect their people and culture is to kill you because you're refusing to worship the millions and millions of gods. So that was what he'd been taught. That's how he lived. So he sought out Christians all through Darjeeling to persecute, to kill. And then one day he started having this dream. And I wish he could have been there over lunch as he just told me with excitement. He started dreaming that there was a man holding a baby and the baby was speaking. Now this dream bothered him so much because he kept having it night after night that he decided to go back to his mother in the village and ask her to help him interpret and understand his dream. What he didn't know is that his mother, over the last couple of years, had been taught Jesus Christ by some of the missionaries and had become a Christ follower. So he goes and he tells her the dream. And his mother says to him, well, what was the baby saying? And the baby was saying, Silas, why are you persecuting me? And his mother told him the story out of the book of Acts, where the same thing happened to Saul, who became Paul. And he said, I am now a Christ follower and God has come near to us. He is Emmanuel, God with us. He's the only one and true God. And now he's calling you. He is speaking to you. Why are you persecuting him? And on the testimony and witness of his mother, he becomes a Christ follower. And now he lives his entire life to do some things I can't tell you about, but to make sure everyone who has not heard the gospel of Jesus Christ hears it. And he lives in constant threat of those he used to run with. Every day, literally every day, his life is in jeopardy. Yeah, he's got to watch his back because he's, he's aggressive. He'll talk to anyone, anywhere. Why? Because what Jesus did for him is more real than what anybody else could possibly do to him. Do you understand that's what happened with the disciples in Acts chapter 5? When they said they were rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name, for the name of Jesus. Why would, you, why would you rejoice when somebody disgraced you or shamed you? And the answer is, what do I care what the peasants think when I have the honor of the king? When what Jesus did for you becomes more real to what anybody could possibly do to you, you'll live a fearless life. Let me keep going just a second here. Most of us or some of us hate ourselves. We literally, we're riddled with low self-esteem because we don't really trust in the love of grace of God. 
I mean, we live with this constant dissatisfaction, this quiet desperation, this depression, because we've got this feeling that we just don't matter, that we're insignificant, and who cares if we live or die? Now, let me tell you something that life has taught me as well. When what Jesus says about you becomes more real to you than what other people say about you, you're going to have a self-esteem that's off the charts. Not only that, you're going to enjoy your life again. Think about it. When you live your life trying to gain the approval of other people, first, it's tiring. It takes too much effort. you got to be on top of it all the time. You gotta worry about what you dress like, what you look like, what shoes you wear, what your hair looks like, how many cars, or where you live in the community. Oh, it's tiring. But you know the worst thing? You'll get to the end of your life and actually hate your life. Because you realize you've been living your entire life for other people and you really didn't want to do this in the first place. So you'll work a job that you hate just so you can gain the significance of people to see you have money and stuff. And then you'll get to be 52 or 53 like I am. And you'll look back over your life and think, man, my life stinks. I hate this. Why did I care what you thought? Young people, listen. God's got a passion in you. There's a heartbeat that you have that you really want to do something. But you're afraid to do it. And you know why? Because you're afraid you're going to make a little less money and not as many people will know your name. Do it. You're going to be so much more happy. Go with the call of God. There's something to be said. When what Jesus says about you, that he loves you so much that he walked between the pieces for you, that the infinite became finite, that he who is immutable, unchanging, changed, took on the form of a servant so that he would find you. When you understand how much God values you, you will be free to live as you truly want to live and obey the passions of your heart. Most of us are in the situations we're in because we're living for other people, somebody else rather than the calling of God. And finally, this is the end, but stay with me. We're anxious and fearful of the future because death is more real to us than Jesus' resurrection. For many of us, death is more real to us than the resurrection. You know, as you get older, if death is more real to you than Jesus' resurrection, as you get older, you're just going to be cranky. You ever met a cranky old person? Just complain about everything. Cranky, cranky, cranky. I mean, just complain. You know why? They're not facing the truth that they're going to die. But they know down deep inside, man, my days are limited. I'm a lot closer to death than I was 50 years ago. But if Christ's resurrection is more real to you than death, do you know how much you're freed up to live? Let me give you an example. Okay, today's Super Bowl. Many of you do not care. This year, I'm one of those. I really don't care. Uh, I don't have a dog in the fight. I could care less if either team wins or loses. But let's say you're a Patriots fan. Just for argument's sake, you're a big Patriots fan. And you think Tom Brady's just gorgeous and all that stuff. (laughs) Let's say that you have to leave the country and you're not able to watch the game today. And you come back on Tuesday and I'm your friend and I recorded the game for you and I hand you a tape and I say, here, I recorded it for you. And I say, by the way, the Patriots won. Now, the attitude with which you watch the game is going to be entirely different than the attitude with which you would watch the game if you didn't know the outcome. Let me give you an example. You know the Patriots win, right? In the second quarter, there's a fumble on the one-yard line. If you don't know the end result, you're going to say, dude, I can't believe you did that. Are you cr- we're going to lose. No, not now. You know what your attitude is now? It's like, wow, I wonder how we're going to recover from that. <laughs> Tom Brady throws an interception, okay, in his own end zone. What are you doing, Brady? What are you doing? We're going to lose. But not if you know the end. You're going to say, wow. Wow. I wonder how we're going to recover from that. I wonder how beauty pattern design is going to come out of this chaos. (laughs) You get my point? See, you're supposed to know the end of the tape. And if you know the end of the story, it's supposed to inspire you to live totally differently. So when Jesus' resurrection becomes more real to you than death, you're going to live freely. You're going to go after risks. You're not going to put all your hope in this world. You're still going to live in it. And you're going to, hey, 
Be careful. I'm not one of those pastors. I still say, go live life. Go after it. Get, get what you can in the sense of go out there and give your very best. Let God use you to change the world. Yeah, you still live here. Don't go and be a hermit and hide away. Use what God's, go after it, man. If he's inspired you to be a doctor, be a doctor, be the best one. A lawyer, be the best one. Politician, repent. Whatever it is. <laughs> Whatever it is that God wants you to be, do it to the best of your ability, right? Do it. But just know. Just know, you know how the story ends, and you're going to win. And so you should be able to face chaotic moments and say, wow, that's tough to handle in my life. But you know what? I wonder how God's going to recover from that, because you know that he will. Come on now. When you came in, you were given an Ebenezer stone. It's a little stone. It comes right out of the Old Testament. It's a stone of remembrance of the divine intervention of God in the life of every Israelite when they defeated the Philistines. You have it in your hand now. And I want you to have an experience this weekend of where you walk up to the altar and you take the stone, all the stones of remembrance of divine help that have happened all weekend, and you build this altar together as a church. And here's what I want you to do when you walk up. I want you to take, in your own time, I want you to walk up and I want you, as you place the stone, that it's all your regrets and all your frustrations and all your doubts and your worries and your feelings of self, uh, self-loathing or your feelings of insignificance or whatever it is that matters more to you, that has become more real to you than Christ. Drop it in the altar and then pray the prayer, God, please. Now you can't stay at the altar because we can get everybody through. So just drop it in and go back to your seat and then pray, God, help. I I pray that you would help me so that the cross, your cross would be more real to me than anything that I've been carrying. And if you do that, that is the secret to the life Christ came to bring. Here it is, the key. The key to overcoming and living life with passion and vigor and hope is meditating on the cross to such a degree that what Jesus did for you becomes more real to you than what people or circumstances will do or have done to you. And I pray that as you drop the stone, that anything that's more real to you than the cross will go with it. And you will know that God is always with you and his plans to prosper you cannot be thwarted. And his plan to give you every good thing and not withhold any good thing from you cannot be canceled out or voided because the contract is not dependent on you. It's dependent on him. Man, that's good news. Father, thank you for your love and for your passion for us, how you would leave the 99 and go after the one, how you would search the house until the lost coin is found, how the lost son, you would come greeting out on the road, running, kissing, welcoming. I pray that as we bring our stone, the Ebenezer, that whatever burdens we've been carrying, we'd now leave there at the altar. And that every person who drops that stone, I pray for an anointing of the power of your Holy Spirit to give them a vision like they've never had before to the point that where suddenly they would begin to recognize that the cross of Jesus, the cross of Jesus is the answer to every issue that we face because in the cross, it's where God's love for us becomes more real to us than any other issue we face. Holy Spirit move is my prayer in Christ's name. Amen. You've been listening to Today with Jeff Vines. Next time, we'll bring you a new message from Pastor Jeff. You can listen to more messages like this. Just search for Today with Jeff Vines wherever you get your podcasts. You make me want to dance and sing With every single breath I bring I will bring this offering You are my one you bring the wonder Today Today. Today. Today with Jeff Fines. 
Thanks for taking time to listen to this audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. To find out more about us, go to vision.org.au.